Geico presents Our Town, Season 2, a 30-minute podcast produced by Best Bark Communications, a small but fierce client-centered marketing company powered by decades of experience and well-established business networks. Geico, 15 minutes can save you 15% or more on car insurance. Now, here's your host, Andy Ockershausen. This is Our Town, and I'm so pleased with our next guest, a man I've known for over 30 years. He's the type of guy that makes you feel real safe. <laughs> He's the epitome of security. We invited him to our town because he can give us some personal insight on what it takes to have the kind of confidence to be a special agent in charge of the Presidential Protective Division of the U.S. Secret Service. Dave Carpenter went on to serve as former ambassador and assistant secretary of state and then was hired as vice president of global security of PepsiCo. Dave Carpenter, you're part of our town. I'm so glad you decided to come back. Andy, I can't tell you what an honor and a privilege it is to be here. One, it's, it's great to see you, <laughs> but two, just to be a part of this is, is, is special to me. Thank you. Well, our town is, <clears throat> is, is something that Janice created because we lost track of so many people. Like, like Dave Carpenter, we didn't know you were back here till Jim Wells, who who shall remain anonymous. Yes, please. If we can do that, <laughs> I beg, I, I beg you. That. But Dave, I found out so much about you, and you're from the Midwest. And how you know what happened in your background as growing up um, that led you to the Secret Service? Well, it's, it's like anybody else. It's a combination of uh, being in the right place at the right time, a, a little bit of luck and some, some networking with actually f- friends of my family. I, I'm originally from, from Denver, Colorado. Uh, my, Is that where you were born in Denver? I was born in St. Louis. Uh, wow. At when my <laughs> parents were there watching a Cardinals baseball game. This is game. a great story. And at the seventh inning stretch, my mom decided it was time for me to arrive. <laughs> so they whisk her off to the hospital, and I'm now on my place of birth in St. Louis, Missouri. And what year was that, David? 1947. Wow, and the war is over, and you're a, you're almost a, a, a war baby, but you did miss that. Just missed that. But your dad was uh, quite involved in in uh, Oklahoma, was he not? With yeah, my Phillips? my father was a uh, actually he he's from Arkansas originally. He was. You're all from all over, aren't we're, you? We're from everywhere. They, they, <laughs> they tried to still trying to figure out exactly our, our our lineage, but he was from Arkansas. He went to a uh, a school that had a, a total of eight boys in the school, and they won the state basketball championship <laughs> three years running. Of Arkansas? Of, uh, in Arkansas, based on, on solely on him. Right. First of all, he was uh, he was a big man. He was about 6'8", and this was in high school. And two, is he was just uh, one of those gifted athletes. He was- Could uh, do everything. He could do everything. So uh, he he uh, went on to play for, he was, well, first of all, he's the, he's in the Arkansas Hall of Fame. He was inducted at the same time of with Joe Garagiola and Bear Bryant, oh uh, which was a pretty pretty good group to be uh, pre- be sitting at the head table with, and uh, uh, went on to play with Philip sixty six, which was the AAU you, powerhouse. That was a big deal. Yeah, at the, the, time. The, the, Fort Wayne had a team, right? They were played all Akron, over the Midwest. Yeah, they were. It was a precursor to the to the pros. That's right. It was a step up. Yeah, there were there actually wasn't a, the pros really weren't existed at that time, or certainly not as as they know them now. So, they uh, in 1948 they were the AAU champions. And the AAU champion was a, was designated to be to represent the U.S. in the Olympics. Is that right? In forty eight. In nineteen forty eight. In, they in London, England? they went London. To, to London, England, and they won the the gold medal, of which I'm now the proud possessor of, because my father passed away in nineteen eighty eight. So. Well, Dave, what about well? How did you end up at Oklahoma? Your father's an Arkansas. Your mother is a beauty queen. Yeah, my mom was a, was a. You was didn't a, get any of that. I did. I. <laughs> I look like my dad, and I have my mom's athletic ability. You built like it's that. just uh, <clears throat> a little bit embarrassing. I wish it had been the other way, but uh, that's a one. <laughs> but but to end up in Missouri, or however you call it, but then you go to school in Oklahoma. I went to school in Oklahoma on a basketball scholarship. I was uh, uh, I, I grew up in Denver, as I said, and when I was a senior, we were. We ended up second in the state in the state tournament, but we were the number one rated basketball team in the state. And I got a scholarship, full scholarship, to go to Oklahoma State. This is in the 60s. This was in 1965. 
Uh, was Hank Iba? Hank uh, Iba was on his la in his last four years at Oklahoma State while I was there. So he was my coach, Mr. For Mr. The whole time. Mr. Iba, as we called him, uh, oh and we'll always He's forever, a legend forever call him in the Midwest. Correct. Right. Right. With and the Cowboys then. Um, Somewhat de-emphasized their basketball, and the football came along. Correct? They did. It was it was interesting. I, one of the reasons that I was attracted to Oklahoma State when I was a senior in high school, they were I think the number eighth rated team in the nation, and got beat in the uh, NCAA tournament by UCLA, who had at the time Gail, they were beating everybody. Ga had Gail Goodrich was their was their big name. Oh and, God, yeah. But uh, they lost. And John Wooden was still alive. Of course, John right? Wooden was still alive, and they they beat Oklahoma State on a last second shot by Gail Goodrich. So, so I was attracted there because you, you, everybody wants to play for a winner, but. We the the next year was kind of an off year, and <laughs> and actually the whole time I was there was sort of an off year. We had a, we had a good ball club, but we had a, a couple of unfortunate. Uh, we lost a couple of players, one to a, a little bit of a scandal, another to to grades, and we just were never able to really realize our full potential. The name pops in my head. Bob Curlin does that name? Bob mean Curlin played with my dad in the Olympics in forty eight. But was the he first, from Oklahoma? He was from Oklahoma State. He thought. was the guy that they started the goaltending. The big guy, too. The goaltending. He was, he was seven feet tall. Wow. Wow. And that's the reason that goaltending was not allowed. He was the first guy that could actually actually do it and did it quite often. So. Right. When Curl and size at 6'9 or 6'10 or seven, 7 feet, well, now he's 7 feet, but yeah. he had to grow up into it. Almost every other player now in basketball is between 6'8 and 7 feet. It's amazing. Yeah, no. You know, five, a guy that's 5'10 almost is, is dead in basketball. Yeah, no, that's, tr the size that's true. And the arms and so forth. There was sort of an interesting, that 48 team was was really interesting in that uh, they also had what was, at the, at the time, the first black Olympic Black, the black, black uh, American to play in the Olympics, a guy by the name of uh, uh, Don Barksdale, to play on a basketball team, oh, I yeah. should say. And uh, uh, my dad told me a lot of stories that to this to this day were appalling. Uh, Barksdale couldn't eat with them. Oh, it was it couldn't stay in the same hotel. So if they walked into a restaurant and they wouldn't serve Don, then they all left, and they went to a restaurant that would. And it was that sort of a. A, a camaraderie between the yeah. between the players, uh, that, you know, back in the in the late forties. But by the time you got in school, things had changed dramatically. At things had changed State. a lot. Yeah, a lot. Now, did you study criminal justice while you were at school? No, I actually I was a business major. And Not a bad idea. It was a good idea at the time. I had no idea what I was going to do with it. Uh, I grad to that to that point. I graduated from uh, college. And went home to to Denver for the for the summer. I, I during the summers while I was in college, I worked at Coors Brewery. Uh, one because it was <laughs> a good place to work, and they paid well. And two, it was a, it was a brewery, so it was they treated you pretty well. <laughs> but a wonderful place to work, I'm sure. A wonderful place to work. It's a family owned business. It's a family owned right? business. Uh, and they actually had signed me, hired me to be in their personnel department, their HR department. But it was a position that wasn't funded. And they said it'll take us a year uh, to, before we can bring you on full time. So they asked if uh, I'd continue working in the brewery in what was just an awful, awful job until they <laughs> hired me. So with that, armed with that, I, I went home and just coincidentally, uh, when it was talking to a neighbor of my parents uh, over a cup of coffee, and I, he said, "Are you? In, would you be interested in law enforcement? And I said, I would. I said, actually, I'd be interested in the Secret Service. Wow. And he and he said, well, that was your first inkling that well, I had read an article on them when I was in college, okay. actually on a basketball trip. And uh, <laughs> it got it caught my interest. But like everything when you're in your yeah, it was a sort of fancy passing fancy. He said, it just so happens I the, the guy that's an agent in charge of the Denver office is a very good friend of mine. And I'll set you up with an interview. The rest is up to you. Right. Got you so in the door. He got me in the door. I went down. I hit it off with this guy. And about a year and a half later, after they'd done a pretty exhaustive background, they hired me and uh, offered me the choice between going to Phoenix, Arizona, or L.A. And where Phoenix, were you going to get the training? Phoenix sounded a lot better. You get it in D.C. Everything. I came back. Oh, you came back. Everybody here, trains here in D.C. All the Secret Service. Uh, at the time, there, there's. Uh, uh, 
Training Academy was on H Street downtown here. Oh God! <laughs> oh yeah, well. it, it was it was uh, interesting. Close and to the Times Herald building, wasn't it? Very, cl very close. Yeah, very close. I right, right that. around the corner. And the headquarters was on G Street, as a mm -hmm. matter of fact. So uh, all your training you did here, then over the of course of time they moved it out to Beltsville, Maryland, where their 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 major academy is. Right, now. that's a. They and do I, a lot of a lot of uh, uh, drills out there. I know right. we see them on local television. Right. And then they gave you a choice, and you could pick Phoenix or Los Angeles. Phoenix or L.A. I, I, I took L.A. Uh, or excuse me, I took Phoenix just because it it was closer, and, right. I, and it sounded uh, it sounded like a lot more fun, quite frankly. But uh, uh, came came back here for I mean, most of the time I was here. M most of my time that I was assigned to Phoenix, I was actually in Washington D.C. or traveling, because I was single. Uh, and it was during the, the uh, 19, in preparation for the 1972 pre presidential campaign. That's another reason I was, I was lucky enough. When I say timing is everything. Timing is, oh, you're in, right. In 1968, when Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, nobody was protecting them. So Congress ordered that Secret Service thereafter would protect, protect presidential candidates and Secret Service only had. It didn't happen until after 68, I 68. didn't 68, and actually they didn't start doing it until 72 uh, because they had to hire people. They only had, we only had 400, I think 430 agents in uh, 1960 or 1971. And uh, of course now they have. That's your first five, year. Close to 5,000, yeah. So yeah, over a thousand now, of course. Five thousand. Five thousand. Oh yeah, it's, it's changed quite a bit. <laughs> oh, I never realized that. Yeah. But it's, it's very interesting to talk to you about the beginning. This in '71, and in, in, in the world had changed then, and the uh, service had gotten a lot more uh, uh, duty. Correct. A lot more. You were doing a lot more things. A lot more responsibility. And who was the chief? Was Rowley the chief then? James and, Rowley was the was the director of the Secret Service. I remember and was for well. my, my first 10 or 11 years. I, he was there a long yeah, time. He was, he was there a long time. Was, he was sort of a local in our town. Yeah. You know, I'd see him in restaurants and bars and everything. He was just, you know, one of the guys. He was a great man. He was a really a, a terrific He had a great reputation man. and yeah. Congress loved him. I know that. Yeah, they did. They did. They respected him. Well, we're talking to Dave Carpenter and um, we're going to take a break. To, uh, but you've got such a great story, it's going to take you some time, Carpenter. <laughs> this is our town. This is Andy Ocker's house, and we'll be right back. You're listening to Love Advice with Leanne. Caller, you're on the air. Uh, hi, Leanne. Long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> Why, in your professional opinion, do you never take my calls off the air? Is this Carl? Yep, it's Carl. I mean, we had a few dates. Everything was great, I thought. Uh... Well, you know... When you switch to GEICO, you could save a lot of money on car insurance. Okay, awesome. You should call them. I will. GEICO, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. You're listening to Our Town. This is Our Town. This is Andy Arkansas. <laughs> I'm chatting with David Carpenter. He's got such a incredible background. I mean, to be born almost at a Cardinals baseball game or something. Now, he's, a, of course, a Cardinals fan. Um, I have a great relationship with our Cardinal here in Washington, uh, who is the um, spokesman for the Pentac I mean, the, um, Archdiocese. the Papals and the Archdiocese. And I keep telling him he's not my favorite Cardinal. I say, Stan Musial. Musial. He said, that's a good choice. I said, I'll take it. <laughs> you remember Musial? He, he was, he was my, I had the autographed baseball, first baseman's glove. Uh, oh, my God. Yeah, Stan the man. Stan the man. A local guy from Denora, Pennsylvania. Did you know that? I, I did not know it's that. Very I did not well, not that. local, but he, he was almost in our town. So, Dave, we're talking to you now. You, you joined the uh, service, and you paid your dues, and then you were assigned to the White House detail. Correct. But you were, you were initially an agent in the field, correct? I was an agent in the field for three years. And um, they, as you know, they, they rotate the guys through every three to five years. So my, uh, my name came up and I, this was during uh, President Nixon's time. And so when I first went to the White House was with President Nixon. Right. Uh, uh, and he, of which he resigned three weeks later. <laughs> I don't think, I don't believe I had anything to do with it. But maybe it was a lack of confidence or something on his on his part. But anyway, he was gone one day and we had a, a new president uh, the next. So I was there during the entire... Uh, you went president through the Ford, whole transition. The whole transition to, through, to, to uh, President Ford, then on the transition to President Carter. 
wow. for about two and a half years, and then I was transferred to Los Angeles. And the one you avoided initially. The one I avoided initially, uh, but it was a great experience. I'm, I'm so glad I had that experience. Right. I was out there about almost five years, but during that five years, Ronald Reagan becomes president, and Ronald Reagan is campaigning, and Ronald Le Reagan lives in California. In guy. California, so we were right in the thick of things there. So he becomes president. Were you in charge of the office? No, I was. I was just. Uh, I was just a field agent at the time. You were learning, of course. I, I was still. In training. I was still. I had at that time. This was in 1981. So I had 10 years on the job, and so. Um, in 1982, I got transferred back. I got promoted and transferred back to something they call the Dignitary Protective Division, which protects people like uh, Queen Elizabeth, oh, visitors. Uh, Saddam Hussein, right. the, the chief executive of these countries that come here to, to, to visit with our folks. So, but but you were not with Reagan, and when you came, when you I wasn't came with. Back. I was not with Reagan. I did a lot of work. A lot of work for him when he was in L.A. Uh, advance work yeah. uh, for the uh, to help out with the detail both prior to him becoming president and after he became president, and then just it came back to to Washington and uh, uh, from did I was in charge of the what they called at the time the candidate nominee protective division which was for the 1988 uh, presidential campaign we had 16 people people don't remember that 16 people running for for president. Uh, and then when when uh, Mr. Uh, Bush won, then I was in charge H. of H.W. Bush, right. Bush. When he won, I was in charge of the inauguration for him. That was just sort of a natural transition for me. Right. And then following that, I went to the intelligence division. And one day I got a call from the agent in charge of the president's detail saying, we'd like for you to come over to the detail as the deputy, the number two guy. For Learn the ropes. Huh? With President Bush which I jumped at, uh, I mean, it was just a, a, a tremendous honor, one that I never expected, I hopefully was deserving of. Got there and uh, as, as, again, timing, luck. Oh, it's all, and, and being it's, there the and right And just place. being in the right spot. Right. Uh, we got a call from the director of the Secret Service who said, you better, we'd like you to, my, my boss and I, uh, put together a transition plan if George Bush should lose to Bill Clinton. And at the time, I think Bush's approval rating was 90%. Oh, it was and amazing thought, right after the war. We thought, uh, quite no, honestly, I, I, uh, we probably won't spend a lot of time on this plan because it, it, it won't go into effect. But as we got Nobody closer to the that. election, we thought, well, we, we, better, we better get this together real quickly. Remember the line, watch my lips, no yeah, new taxes? No new taxes, yeah. Wow. Yeah. They kept playing and playing and playing that. Now, in your relationship with the presidents, but they're different with each one. But George Bush was is still one of the most gregarious guys around our town. You know, George Bush was George Bush, and he was a great yeah. guy. He was a, a sort of a, a man's man. Not that the others weren't, but he was even more so. I mean, he could, he you could just relate with him very easily, and he with you very easily. So, and that, that's why. Um, you know, Reagan was different, of course, and then Clinton was different. They're all every all of these people bring different things, but but Mr. Bush H. W. was such a big part of being around our town. He's a very good. Remind me of your dad, George Bush was a good athlete, you know? fabulous athlete. Yeah, he's a great baseball player. He didn't get any credit for that. Yeah, um, he, he wasn't with the St. Louis Cardinals. That's right. right. <laughs> yeah, but he's a good tennis player. Oh, he, a very I mean, good he, tennis he, player. There was very little athletically that he didn't excel at. Now he's, he's jumping out of the airplane. I uh, know. <laughs> he's going to do it. He said he's going to do it when he's 95. And Barbara said, no way. Uh, uh, let's hope not. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, he jumps on somebody's back. You understand yeah, that. Yeah. He, he doesn't free fall. Well, Dave, but now you're in the, the White House and you're working on the detail and you're deputy. Now, how did you get to the next job? You pushed well, the guy out of work. Well, of the... Uh, <laughs> The when uh, Jim Wells, I right? went, I went to uh, Arkansas the night of the election to Little Rock, at, to with the idea that if, that if the Clintons would win, I would pick up the responsibility. I'd be responsible for the security of the president elect. You were on the spot, and my former boss uh, was the boss of the presidential detail with Bush would stay there right until the transition was made, and we would b roughly use half of the presidential detail for President Clinton and half for President Bush until the full transit, till we 
uh, homogenize the entire. Logistics the, must the, be fabulous. Uh, it was very, department. very, it was really, really, it, it, was, it was a challenge, believe me. So uh, uh, I was with him for from the 91 until we got to the inauguration. And then on the, I stayed with him for about almost three years after. Were that. you on the bus? Didn't they ride up here on a bus? I, from came, up, I came up on the bus. <laughs> I came, yeah, I was with him night and day, really, for uh, for the longest time, it seemed, for for almost three years. And you got, a well, you got along with him real well. I got along with him real well. I mean, he, he treated, he both he and his wife treated me the and the other agents like... Uh, uh, I well, stopped short of saying family, but they treated us like very good friends. And you're uh, so important yeah. to the, no, to they, the president. And, and they understood that, and they they were very very good. They didn't buck the detail then, right? No, no. I mean, there are certain things. I mean, believe me, if you had a bunch of you know oh. men, <laughs> men hanging around you full time, you know, uh, violating your space, it's it gets a little annoying. But they they. They you, could you tolerate on, it. You weren't yeah. on the detail and went to Columbia. Of course, that was much later, wasn't it? Yes. No, I, I missed that. I missed that trip. <laughs> it could have been. Yeah. But Dave, now, in, in your relationships and your duties, uh, you have both a personal and a business relationship with the president. And uh, one benotes the other. But the president does not control the Secret Service. No, he not only at all. works with the uh, agent in charge, correct? He works with the agent in charge, and there's there's some give and take. I mean, they're you know they all have little, uh, they they have their own priorities. Right. They have their own way of doing things, and you have to you sort of uh, you figure that out. You have to understand that you got to give you got to work. Much, you got to give them as much space as you can without violating, or without right. worrying about them getting hurt or somebody harming them. Uh, but th for the most part, they listen to what the service says. They don't always like it. But I never had a time when they said, no, we're not going to do that. And never had that. And right. would never have. He understood. He understood it. Well, he was uh, the most happy man I've ever seen. The night Arkansas won the NCAA. Were you I was with there. him? Yeah, of course. Yeah. There. <laughs> there's, you, a, there's, a, the game? there's a bust of my dad in the field house there <laughs> <laughs> at the uh, University of Arkansas in, in Fayetteville. Uh, there was one. We actually we played there when I was in college. And we walked in and it was the. The bust of my father was over the entrance. So, so some of the other guys on the team were going, "What? Ha what happened to you?" And I, I said, take too, off your I'm head. Too short. I was too short. But uh, Nolan was it Nolan Richardson was Nolan the coach? Richardson was a coach. Yeah. But that was a big night for for Bill Clinton. It's I huge. Remember. It was and huge for the state of Arkansas. Yeah. He's a big. He was a big fan. But Still the, is. The whole basketball operation down there has changed dramatically. They're not as competitive as they were then. No. And Nolan was a great coach. I remember watching it. That Clinton, I've never seen anybody as happy as he was. Uh, he was, he was thrilled. That was his school, of course. Yeah. Now, David, this now has gotten you to the point where you're four years or five years with Clinton. You didn't stay the whole eight, did you? No, I didn't. No, I, I, I left uh, uh, sort of at, on my own at my own behest because you, you do you realize when you're getting tired when you're worn out and and it's exhausting that, oh it is i'm that sure work that. is uh it's pressure packed it's exhausting it's it takes a hell of a toll on your family i remember my uh, my son saying one day there was an article in uh i think it was the washington post but it may have been one of the other periodicals that said that i was there that my it was about me and they said that I was there uh, so that I got shot instead of the president. <laughs> and my son said, this isn't true, is it? I go, no, you can't. You just can't believe. You just can't believe this stuff. But it, it, it clearly scared him. I mean, it, it really did frighten him. And I, I just remember talking to my wife that night, saying, you know, you know what Mark said to me today? And it, uh, she said, well... It's up to you. You know, you do what you got to do. Well, well, Reagan got shot in '81, but you weren't there. You weren't at the White House. Then. I was in L.A. I was still in L.A. when he you hadn't yeah. come east yet. Yeah, right. Man, if you'd have been there, you'd have probably protected him. Yeah, there. Well, we're going to give you a medal. Yeah, for that. We'll, 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 <laughs> well, now yeah. we've got you back to the point where you're retiring from the. Uh, are you leaving the White House? Did you decide to retire. I actually went to. I, I didn't. At the, at, when I left the White House, I went to uh, the Washington Field Office, which is their biggest, the Secret Service's biggest office here in, in the district as the agent in charge. And I was there for about two and a half years right. and um, decided I wanted to try my hand in the private sector, and which lasted about two weeks. I was working with a company called Iridium, a Motorola offshoot, and I got a, a, a call from uh, Madeline Albright's office at State Department. Uh -huh. that she would like to see me. 
and I thought, he's what have I, you know, what have I done now? So I, I had you ever worked with her? Other I than had worked. Her? I had worked with her at the White House when she was. you working for the president. She was Secretary of State at, 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 during that right. time, and she traveled with us. So I, I knew her. Right. I knew her staff, and I knew a lot of her agents, the diplomatic security agents. And Were they Secret Service? People? They no, they're State Department. I they're gotcha. the State Department's equivalent of Secret Service. Gotcha. Secret Service at the time was Treasury. Now they're Homeland Security. State Department was State Department. So she she asked me over and said she would she wanted to professionalize the organization that they had never had a, a law enforcement professional head the agency and would I accept the position of Assistant Secretary of State for Diplomatic Security, which I was thrilled. Oh, and, absolutely! And uh, a, a part of that came the title of ambassador, ambassador as a part of the office. And you have to be confirmed for that? By a, the Senate? A, a Senate confirmation, right? which takes a while. And even, even in the best circumstances, takes a while. We don't know how you pass that. I now. don't know either, but <laughs> let's just say we, I did. But while I was in the process of being confirmed, one of the big responsibilities of this position is the security of the American embassies overseas. Well, Al Qaeda uh, oh. put off, uh, uh, had car bombs in both Dar es Salaam and Nairobi and blew up those two embassies, killed a bunch of Americans as well as a lot of native folks. And they confirmed me in a recess appointment overnight. Uh, yeah, so, they needed you in, yeah, so in the job. Off and running we went and I spent over, I would say, something in the neighborhood of 250 straight days out of, out of the country. Uh, traveling, traveling, looking at the embassies and trying to set up security. Now, when you were at the White House, did you have did you ever have quarters at the White House, or you always lived off campus? I always lived away, but I was I, I should have. You know, there were times when you could. I yeah. should have. I, well, I, there were times when I did I did sleep in my office. To be quite right, honest, sure. because I knew that the next morning, because with President Clinton, certainly as we all know, he's a, a runner. <laughs> and sometimes he likes to run very early in the morning. And he's a goer, and too. He's, he can go. And he, he was deceptive. People said, well, he can't, that's not really, he's not a real runner. I said, come out there with him sometime. And, uh, I believe he, what he you, would, you know what you're talking he, about. He can run. He can run. Now, and but when you're on the detail and you're traveling with this, these embassies, do they provide quarters for you? Are you off campus or how You're off work? campus. They, uh, it depends, you know, it depends where you are. Sometimes the embassies will, have, I'd stay with the ambassador at the ambassador's residence. Right. Or you'd stay in a local hotel or someplace near the embassy. Uh, just, and they were, they were all good good places, of course. Well, yeah, good being relative. I mean, there's some places in this world that are uh, are not quite as comfortable well, you know, as me. Washington, D.C. Well, uh, I believe that's, that. that's for sure. Well, David, this is so, so interesting. And I, now we've gotten you uh, detailed out. And so we want to talk to you about the Secret Service today and what's going on and what we hear. Because even though you're not there, and you know what's going on. So... Dave Carpenter knows it all, and this is Our Town with Andy Ockershaus, and we'll be right back. Maybe your kids are about to graduate from college or even get their graduate degree. Or you're looking forward to retirement, finally. Don't go another day without getting your legal house in order. This is attorney Mike Collins. Let me show you how to get a basic estate plan in place that will protect you and your loved ones in the years ahead with our trademarked Reservoir Trust. All I ask is two hours of your time. Check the mail for your special invitation and register now at MikeCollins.com. I'll even waive the tuition. That's MikeCollins.com. Hi, Tony Sybil here to tell everybody about our newest restaurant over off New York Avenue. It's called Ivy City Smokehouse, 1356 Oakey Street Northeast, right next to the Heck Company Warehouse. It is terrific, and we have the only seafood smoker in the District of Columbia. So when you go to your grocery stores or your delis, ask for Ivy City products. 202-529-3300 or ivycitysmokehouse.com. You're listening to Our Town with Andy Ockershausen. Brought to you by Best Bark Communications. This is Our Town. This is Andy Ockershausen. And Dave Carpenter now is out of the service. He's a, He's paid his dues by working for Secretary Albright. He's traveled the world. He is now retired. And he is an eye on... The Secret Service in the world. And we read so much about it, Dave, that um, there's so much going on. Just today, they announced a new head of the Secret Service. I saw it in the post. It's an ex-Marine general. And I don't know who's left in Marine Corps because all of them look like they're working for the White House. 
but uh, things have changed dramatically since you retired. Things really have, and they haven't changed necessarily for the uh, for the right reasons. I think there has been a uh, the perception or a lack of confidence in the job that the Secret Service has has been doing, based on some very unfortunate events. Some of which were controllable, uh, should never have happened. Others which aren't weren't quite as bad as I think they were reported out. At the end of the day, the Secret Service is all, it lives on its reputation. It lives on, on its integrity. And Sterling lot, reputation. And that reputation and that integrity has been tarnished yes. at, at best and uh, hopefully not destroyed. And I think there are a lot of people who are looking for something, who love the Secret Service. Outside, I'm talking people on Capitol Hill, uh, uh, presidents past and present, who really appreciate the job that the Secret Service does that doesn't want to see that reputation uh, Sorry. tarnished. Yeah, they, they really don't, and they want to help. And I think that in... That with this naming of this the new uh, the new director of the Secret Service from outside the agency, which is unprecedented, never been done before. Is that correct? That's is, the first time. Yeah, is I the first time, and it is an attempt at trying to restore that integrity. And I'm sure that this that the the the, the gentleman who's who's coming in that will be job one is to 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 return them to their to to the reputation that they once held that has been for, like I say, some very, some unfortunate circumstances has been tarnished. Well, the thing I was interested in in the article is the former, the acting chair, or the acting director is staying on as deputy to this new director, which I think is a good sign. It is a good sign. And, and he was uh, actually... Continuity. He, he had just been appointed. Uh, he was a deputy director prior to, uh, I think maybe just prior to the election. Right. And so when the former, uh, Joe Clancy, the former director, uh, uh, retired or, or left, uh, uh, he was a natural to keep continue running the agency. Well, that until, continuity is important. Uh, continuity is it's critical. It's, it's, it's critical to everything. And he's, he'll stay on because, one, he's a, a, a very, good, very good guy, a good man, knows the agency and right. will be a, a tremendous help to the new director. He'll help him on the hill and help him in an in interdepartment relationship. Now, I'm sure that the the um, the whole thing is with the um, the change in administration that uh, that with the Trumps are present an entirely different problem than you had with Obama. Obama had some a lot of people. I mean, he had two daughters going in and out of school and so forth. But now it looks like Trump's got we the people. Yeah, I mean, you got so many people you got to look out for. It's I, I think the number of people that the, the service has been protecting more people every year, quite frankly, since I left the agency, <laughs> and that that number just makes it increasingly different difficult to um, and expensive. It's expensive. It's hard to one of the things uh, that they're having a difficulty with now is maintaining people uh, on the rolls. They're they're quitting and going to other agencies. Uh, because they don't have to travel as much, they get paid overtime. They're they're paid for each hour worked. A lot of Secret Service aren't paid for each hour worked. Uh, the, their overtime rules and regulations are slightly different. Um, so their attrition has really taken its course. I just heard a, a statistic the other day. Last year they hired 700 wow. people into the Secret Service, but 700 people had left. So it's a wash. So it's, 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 yeah, it, it didn't really it, increase it doesn't, it at all. It doesn't increase much at a time when the, the protective load is increasing uh, exponentially. Now, um, we see and hear all the time about the problem that the service had had with the grounds of the White House and protecting the, uh, the grounds and the president. I don't recall any president ever being threatened at all on the grounds, but certainly the jumpers and the people we've read about. But you bring a new, a new thought to our discussion. This is not new. It's no. been going on, and it's it's not any new attempt to assault anybody. No, that the there are the the occurrences of with fence jumpers and gate callers and and the like is uh, I won't say it's certainly not a weekly occurrence, but it's a monthly occurrence where someone for either uh, as a dare will jump the fence right. and jump back over. Uh, or actually has intentions of of just seeing how far they can get, how close to the house they can get, or the most you know the most infamous, if you will, the the, the gentleman that jumped last uh, I think it was last year and got made it all the way into the into the house, yeah. and then the one that just recently 
walked around on the grounds for you know 17 minutes or something like that. Uh, those <laughs> but should they not, had him under surveillance. They, and they, they, said, they, 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 they knew that they had someone on the property. They just simply couldn't find him. So uh, that was that was a, the, the challenge. But one of the things that uh, I mean, a, a lot of a lot of my friends ask me, you know, why, what's wrong with the Secret Service? Why don't what, when these people come over the fence? Why don't they just shoot them? And and, <laughs> yeah, and you yeah. know, I mean, I think sometimes. Uh, but trust me, there's nobody in a in the Secret Service on that grounds that's afraid to shoot anybody. But it's there's also a great amount of discipline when you've got a oh, weapon. And there's a lot of they don't consider it a there's threat. a lot of shootings going on in this country right now that have caused tremendous outrage of unarmed people. And someone jumps a fence and runs up to the White House, doesn't have a weapon visible, is not trying to striking out at anybody. The president isn't there. The first lady's not there. The kids aren't there. They're actually gone. It uh, now should the door have been locked and to a keep them from getting in the house absolutely that was a huge mess we've um, all left doors open from time to time yeah this was a case where and that person's no longer with the secret service that should have locked the door right. let me put it that way that said uh the idea of shooting this an unarmed let's call it emotionally if not mentally right. deranged veteran uh is not one that i i think the the discipline that the guys had showed that day is is incredible because it would have been easy to shoot him it would have been very easy well to they shoot had him. to the guys up on the roof had him in the sight they could the have, they time. could have shot him if you look at the photographs you'll see the guy on the front on the front porch had his gun aimed at the guy he could have shot him but the guy wasn't posing a threat the right. president's not there that's it's a shoot or don't shoot and that's there's laws in this country that dedicate dictate that you do that now i was i i have to admit i was working there in 19 76 when a gentleman came over with a a, a, a a huge pipe and was strike trying to hit uniformed officers and we locked the front door the president was in the house and the uniform officer on the front porch of the white house shot and killed the guy that was uh there was a public outcry of that how do how dare you shoot this poor guy it was just a pipe well this guy was mentally off <laughs> And was he, a threat. he was Absol a threat to, to, to the safety of the officers out there. Now, so. we, we grew up, uh, I grew up here at WMAL. I had never heard that story. It must have happened, and I'm sure there was publicity, but we didn't make a big thing of it as a broadcast company. And the, the thing I said to you initially, Dave, is that everything that's happened in America or the world now, somebody in the area has got a telephone because they got a phone with a camera in it right i think it's changed the whole dynamics of a lot of law enforcement for one thing people are now being watched uh, no question about it and there's there's law enforcement uh, not unlike medicine is not a black and white black and white situation <laughs> there's a lot of judgment involved in it and sometimes the angle that these things are portrayed uh belies what actually happened Correct. there uh, that's, uh, but the, the thing that I'm most impressed with is most law enforcement agencies, if not all, are not afraid to go to these cameras on their officers to prove their innocence. I mean, this is a tough job. Uh -huh. And the more information versus an eyewitness testimony or a camera elsewhere, somewhat some distance away from an actual incident on the officer, I think helps law enforcement. So law enforcement isn't trying to hide anything. They're not out there to shoot innocent people or harm anyone. I mean, some, sometimes it happens, happens but right. it's certainly not by design. And it certainly doesn't happen with the Secret Service. I mean, the the, uh, the original intent of the Secret Service was protect. It didn't say that to shoot people to protect. And whatever happened to the uh, the forgery division? Did you ever work in that? Yeah, the, they're they're still going strong now. It's a, now it's the financial crimes as they, that they call it because you know, with this with the all the fi the credit card theft and uh, and all of that, it's it a, comes under secret it's, service. It's, it still comes under the secret service uh, under Homeland Security now Treasury. Right. It, it all started with Treasury and then now it's all come under Homeland Security. Well, the Secret Service used to be under the Secretary, used to be under of, the Secretary Treasury, right? of Treasury. Yeah. Now it's under Homeland. Right. 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 That's a new... David, it's amazing what a wonderful career you've had and how you brought to the table. Do you have a group? Uh, do you consult with the uh, the Bureau at all? Do you have a group that, that you can bring your knowledge to? Do they call you in as a teacher or instructor? I, I haven't done anything formally because once I left 
well, the Secret Service, and then went to State Department, and it did that, and then went to Pepsi for for thirteen. Oh, I forgot to say for that. thirteen years. I was that there. That was a fabulous job, and that was a fabulous job. There was an opportunity because there's I was a part of a lot of different affiliations within Pepsi and the law enforcement community, the the, the private sector. And that law was a worldwide job. That too. was a worldwide job too. So you end up speaking publicly on a lot at different forums on on security enhancements and uh, <laughs> what's appropriate and not appropriate and it's a very well your experience it was, it was an interesting that was an interesting so why they don't change. call you back well i you know it's a funny idea i've had i've had some calls and i've actually done a, a couple of things but i am so enjoying now time Life. with my friends family former colleagues uh, and just uh, and well, you you came back to our town in some way. You didn't move back into our town. You're up at I'm in Annapolis, Annapolis. Uh, uh, by because I've 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 always loved Annapolis. I lived there some years ago. You're on the Severn too, aren't you? I was on the Severn, yeah. And so it's I heaven. And it's it's spectacular. And I, uh, I I it's it's good for me. It's good for my family. It's good for my. I've got all my friends want to come out now. Some of the friends I thought I'd never see again. They're they're, they're quick to show up and, well, and get on the boat. I'm sure Wells was on the first boat, yeah, he, and he, he brings Al Barry with he him. Couldn't wait to get there. But David, uh, you know your career has been so fabulous, and in the years with Pepsi, and the, did you go to Russia? David Kendall put Pepsi Cola in Russia how many fifty years ago? I guess. Yeah, and he's the first one. First one. He's still there, and I've been to I've been to Russia a number of times with with Pepsi. Actually, I've been there with obviously with the. Is it still big president. in Europe? Pepsi. Uh, Pepsi. Yeah, Pepsi is is big in Europe. Coke is, you know, as you can imagine, still. Uh, Still a challenge, right? Uh, Always, they're they're, they're out good there. competition. But Pepsi, as if you, they're they're just doing. Fab. It's a, it's one of the best corporations. I'm comparing notes with my security former security company. Just the best corporation out there. They really they take, take care of their they people. take care of their people. It, it's uh, a lot of companies say people first, but I think they really mean it. Uh, the CEO certainly, both CEOs that I worked right. for did. Uh, and Don Kendall still, he's still. Uh, he's got to be in his nineties. He's now, in of his nineties. He's up in Montana, I believe. Retired. I remember then they opened up Russia. They beat Coke there, and uh, yeah. I guess the, the sweetness and stuff everybody loved. Well, I will tell you, David, you're a delight to have back in our town, and I hope that you will see more of you, and I hope you will remember to come to our special opening for our second season. You'll see a lot of names of people that you that you may know or may not know but the whole idea is to get everybody together to you know get our town and say thank you and uh, we'll have a wonderful evening together and we'll even bring jim wells i, I, I thank you for that uh, that's very very <laughs> Very nice of you. I appreciate the opportunity to come down and see, to see you and, and David. You're a fountain of information. Ex exchange. Hey, some, we could uh, do thoughts. this for a couple of hours, but you know we can't because we're busy. <laughs> I, I understand. I understand. And being a cow ex cowboy, you're with you're in good hands here with Allstate. Let me tell you, <laughs> with PepsiCo, you're in gold. You know, twice as much for a nickel too. Pepsi Cola is a drink, drink for, for you. you. Yeah. That's oh, what I grew up with. Yeah. How about there in Oklahoma, huh? Yeah. 10, 2, and 4, Dr. Pepper. Dr. Pepper in Oklahoma, <laughs> yeah, believe yeah. me. Yeah. Dave, yeah, thank you yeah. so much. Dave Carpenter and the Secret Service, we love what you guys have done. Thank the Lord you protect us, and we certainly look forward to many more years of Secret Service. And you've, you've shed some good light on what we live with in our town. So, Dave, thank you, and this is Andy Ockers out, and this is Our Town, and we'll be back. You've been listening to Our Town, Season 2. Presented by GEICO, our hometown favorite, with your host, Andy Ockershausen. New Our Town episodes are released each Tuesday and Thursday. Drop us a line with your comments or suggestions. See us on Facebook or visit our website at OurTownDC.com. Our special thanks to Ken Hunter, our technical director, and WMAL Radio in Washington, D.C. for hosting our podcast. And thanks to GEICO. 15 minutes can save you 15% or more on car insurance.